Now, this morning we are going to invite a very important person in our church community, and、uh, she will give us the Bible reading for us this morning. Grace, would you like to come and do the Bible reading for us? Would you welcome Grace as she comes to do Bible reading? Bible reading for Sunday are Psalms chapter four, verse one to eight, and Psalms chapter five, one to seven. Answer me when I call you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will ye people turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart His faithful servants for Himself. The Lord hears when I call to Him. Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your heart and be silent. Offer the sacrifices for the righteous and trust in God. Many Lord are asking, He will bring us prosperity. Let the light of Your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when the gain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Psalms chapter four, verse one to eight. Listen to my words, Lord. Consider my lament and hear my cry for help. My King and my God, for you I pray. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay in my request. Before you, and wait expectantly, for you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness, and with you evil people are not welcomed. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all those who do wrong, and destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty and detestful you, Lord, detest. But I, by your great love, can come in your house. In reverence, I bow down towards your holy temple. Psalms chapter five, verse one to seven. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Would you thank Grace for doing wonderful job? Well done, Grace. Thank you. It's wonderful.、Uh, this morning, before we get to the message, I wanted to share、uh, some wonderful news regarding mission offering last month.、Uh, about a week ago. I've got a report from God's love ministry in Philippines on how our donation has been spent there.、Uh, three church,、uh, three 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 churches planted by this ministry were and are still struggling because of the pandemic. But here are some good things that has happened because of your generosity.、Uh, last month in September, we raised nine hundred thirty-seven dollars. To be sent to God's love ministry in Philippines, and they spent the money on those following things: they bought 30 COVID face shields, 100 COVID face masks. They bought paste control sprayers and chemicals for three churches. They bought four bags of rice, three boxes of instant Korean noodles. And they bought 200 blocks to fix the damaged wall, and they bought 10 bags of cement, and they paid、uh, wages of two workers fixing church building for three days. Isn't that incredible? <clears throat> Wonderful.、Uh, when I read this report, it brought me into tears. What your generosity signifies is not only that the materialistic needs、uh, of these missionaries are going to be met, but it also means that they are not they they are not forgotten, doing the Lord's work on the front line. The history of the church testifies that the gospel that leads people to eternal life has always been practical. The practicality of the gospel is a sign that the kingdom of God is real. So let us be encouraged by this wonderful report and continue to be the gospel-loving church. Amen.、Mm-hmm. Uh, this morning we'll be exploring a type of a prayer that you will 
find very interesting, as it is a most uh, as it is what most people understand prayer to be. It is prayer of petition or prayer of supplication. In the modern language, it is a prayer when we pray. Uh, it is a pray, prayer that we pray when we need God's help. Now, as you are hearing this, you might be thinking, okay, what is the big deal about prayer of petition? Prayer of petition is a simple and pretty straightforward, isn't it? When we need something, we ask God for it. It is a sort of a prayer that does not really require any instruction. Well, when you read the Bible, you will soon discover that people in the biblical times were more prudent and intentional when they presented their requests to God. For example, in, J- in James chapter 4, verse 3 says this, When you ask you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. See, the scripture indicates that a biblical prayer of a petition is more than just asking God to meet our needs. It takes a bit of inner work. It puts our hearts to the test. Petitionary prayer makes us look into our hearts and ask ourselves if we have the right motives. This is why people in the Bible say prayer is hard. For example, Paul says in 2 Timothy, join with me in struggle by praying to God that it may produce in you patient endurance. Prayer is a struggle. Timothy Keller puts it this way. Prayer is all intimacy and struggle. There is nothing more important or harder or richer or life-altering. Prayer is wonderful yet hard. It is a life-altering yet a struggle. Petitionary prayer tests our hearts, our desires, and our motives. There is another issue of a prayer of a petition. We all know this. If we haven't seen any good biblical examples of a prayer of a petition, we could be either too hot or too cold when we are in need of something that only God can provide. On one side, we could uh, could be way too hot and frantic in our prayer life, and we could be easily disappointed when our prayers do not get answered. And we could be judgmental towards people who are dealing with problems in their lives. Have you ever had anyone say this to you? You just have to pray harder. You're not getting healed or your marriage is still on thin ice because you're not praying hard enough. Well, this comes from an unbiblical understanding of prayer. It is too hot that it burns yourself and others around you. On the other side, we could be way too cold and indifferent when we are in need. If you don't see God as the God describes Him, or do not believe in the effectiveness of a prayer, you might say, why bother? God knows everything. He knows about all my needs. If it is God's plan, it will happen anyway. Why should I care and pray? Now, that is too unbiblical. It is too cold. That is not what the Bible describes how our relationship with God should be. Being too cold is what philosophers would say, deism, which means you see God as an impersonal cosmic force, not a personal relational God. This view is not of the Christian faith, nor it is the God of the Bible. Then you might be thinking, okay, Noah, you are telling us prayer is a struggle. And you are telling us not to be too frantic or too cold when we pray. What are you suggesting that we should do? What is prayer of petition? How do we pray when we need God's help? How should we pray when we await the doctor's report or when our loved ones are sick, or when we are praying for those who haven't come to the personal relationship with Christ. Well, today's 
Bible readings, which uh, Grace beautifully read to us, show us how we can pray when we need God's help. They are very interesting passages to look at. Let me first give you... Oops, sorry. Let me, let me first give you uh, an overview of the two passages. Yep. Are you still with me? Sorry about that. Psalm chapter 4 and Psalm chapter 5 both were written by King David. They do not tell us exactly under what context David wrote these two psalms. But what we know is both these psalms are prayers that David wrote when he was greatly opposed by his enemies. He is crying for a help. They are prayers of petition. And here is an interesting thing that the most uh, uh, commentators would say about these two psalms. That is, they are a set of prayers. One is, one is an evening prayer, and the other one is a morning prayer. In other words, these two psalms, in a sense, show us that there is a rhythm, or, or there is a cycle of a petitionary prayer. In Psalm chapter 4, in evening prayer of a petition, David asks for peace as he goes to bed because he is weighed down dealing with the opposition in his life. Who has felt like that before? Then in Psalm chapter 5, in the morning, he wakes up and David asks God to engage his situation and change his circumstance. You see, at night, David prays for a change of his heart and in the morning, he prays for a change of his circumstance. At night, he prays for an inner change. And in the morning, he prays for an external change. You see, biblical uh, petitionary prayer has a cycle. It has a rhythm. As you breathe in and breathe out, or as you go to bed at night and wake up in the morning, prayer of a petition has two aspects. It has two purposes. They are a change of, our, change of our hearts and a change of our circumstances. You see this in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Jesus told us to pray, God, your kingdom come, that is external, yet he also taught us to pray, your will be done, that is an internal prayer. And metaphorically speaking, the prayer of a petition is not hot and cold, but it is night and morning. It is about both resting in God and pleading to God. Biblically, if our prayer misses any of these two purposes, it is likely that the prayer will lead us to frustration and will say, why isn't God answering my prayer? Or it will lead us to distrust in God's goodness and we will say, oh, God never cares about me. But this morning, we are going to explore the metaphors of each purpose of petitionary prayer. We'll be learning how to biblically ask God for help, looking at the morning and evening prayers of David. So let us begin. One part of the cycle in the petitionary prayer is about resting. In other words, it is about giving up control. Now, just to think about when you lie down, on, uh, lie down on the bed at night. Our body rests as we give up control of it. On one side, the petitionary prayer is about giving up control and trusting in God to care for our needs. See how David begins his night prayer. He prays, give me relief from my distress. In Hebrew, these words paint a picture of something moving out of a tight corner into an open space. Suppose you're at the Gaba to watch the AFL Grand Final where 30,000 people gathered to watch the game. 
After the game, you try to get out of the stadium, getting jammed and squeezed by the swarm of people. You'd be thinking, oh, I need a space. I need an open space. And you get out finally and you say, I, now I can breathe. On one side, that is what the petitionary prayer is about. We pray our needs and concerns that corner and burden us into the hands of God at night. Now, you might say, okay, Noah, it's easy for you to say, but you don't know what kind of opposition that I am faced with. It keeps me awake during the night. Day and night, I think about this problem. It is very hard for me to be peaceful about it. I have been asking God for help about this for a long time, yet he hasn't answered me. How can I rest? How should I pray to get peace? Gabi and I don't very often talk to others about this, but like in any family, in our own family, there is an unresolved situation that we have been praying for a long time. A few weeks ago, we got a phone call from Korea about this again, and we looked at each other and said, why should we bother to pray about this anymore? Without going too deeply about our situation, I will share with you the story that I tell myself when I am in the state of feeling despondent, hopeless, and restless. It is quite profound and theologically sound illustration. And I hope this helps some, some people this morning. The story goes like this. One day, someone's horse ran away. His neighbor came to him and said, bad luck that your horse, ra- horse has ran away. Run away. The man said, what do I know about these things? But a week later, the horse came back with 20 wild horses. The neighbor said, oh, good luck. You now have more horses. The man said, what do I know about it? Next day, trying to tame one of the new horses, the man's son was kicked and his leg was broken. The neighbor said, bad luck. Your son's leg is broken. The man said, what do I know about good luck and bad luck? A few days later, A bunch of thugs came by in search of able-bodied young men for their their gang. They were about to kidnap the man's son. But when they found out that his leg was broken, they left him behind and moved on to the next house. The neighbor said, you are a very, very lucky person. You're very lucky that your son's leg is broken. What this story reminds you and me is that God knows better than we do. What seems to be bad and painful to us now and in this life is not how things will end. The story tells us that God is infinitely wise and we can trust Him, though we do not know why things have happened and happened in our lives. God in His perfect wisdom knows what is best for us. Timothy Keller puts it this way, when we pray, God always gives us answer. He will either give us what we ask or give us what we would have asked if we knew everything that he knew. Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest um, preachers in the 18th century once made this beautiful theological claim. He said, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which the child of God rests his head at night, giving perfect peace. What sovereignty means is that all good and bad things are under God's control. And God, according to his perfect wisdom, in all things he works for the good of those who trust and love him. You might be familiar with what Jesus says in Matthew 6. Jesus says, do not worry about life. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Look at the flowers of the field and how they grow. They do not labor. 
They are more beautiful than Solomon dressed in all his splendor. Do not worry. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Don't you see? Each day has enough trouble. Now what Jesus is saying here is, God gives us strength to face our problem on a daily basis. Max Lucado reflected on Matthew 6 and put it this way. The key to life is this. Meet today's problems with today's strength. Don't start tackling tomorrow's problems until tomorrow. You do not have tomorrow's strength yet. You simply have enough for today. A few weeks ago, on Sunday after church, I talked with this gentleman, beautiful man, who is fighting against, against his wife's cancer. I asked, how are you going? How are you doing? He said, I am taking it one day at a time. One day at a time, as, as the Lord enables me. I didn't tell this to him, but as Gabi and I were going through my own family's issue at the time, I was so encouraged by what he said. It's a real wisdom and right attitude toward our troublesome life. Friends, in the face of our problems, let us take one day at a time, knowing God knows what our tomorrow is going to be like. Let us trust in God and love Him with all of our heart, all of our will, and all of our strength during the day so that our soul can rest in God at night. Putting our case in the hands of a good and sovereign God. This is the first part of the petitionary prayer. Then, when morning comes, we see David's prayer takes a very different form and style. Whereas David rests in God at night, in the morning David prays very assertively, assert, assertively and confidently. Here we see David is not shy about his request at all. He cries out, declare them guilty. Declare my enemies guilty, O God, banish them. You see, this is the other side of the petitionary prayer. It is the external side of it. Once we can fully rest in God's wisdom, once our trust in Him is built and our unselfish motivations in our hearts are subdued, we would be able to ask God to intervene rightly and show us His power. David believes in the power of effect power and effectiveness of a prayer as his soul is refreshed. He believes that God hears his pray, prayers and God could deliver him from his enemies and change his circumstances. Now, let me ask you this question this morning. Do you believe God works through your prayers? Do you believe in the power of your prayers? Austin Phelps, Phelps tells this interesting story in his book on prayer. He talks about a pagan king of Northern, North Embria. I practiced it at the last service, but it never came in a right way. North, Northern, North Umbria, North Umbria. <laughs> So uh, the, the, the guy who wrote this book talks about a pagan king of North Embria and his invasion on Wales. Of course, the Welsh were Christians. And when the king of North Embria saw the army of his opponent spread out before him, he noticed something. In the battlefield, there was a group of unarmed men. And he asked who they were, and he was told that they were the Christian monks praying for the success of the Welsh army. And when he saw the group of praying monks, he immediately realized, realized the seriousness of the situation and the king ordered to attack the monks first. Now, Pelps 
tells this story to allude to this disturbing fact that is, often the non-Christians of the world have more respect for the sturdy reality of prayer than Christians. David's morning prayer encourages us not to be timid in asking God, and it encourages us to believe in the power of prayer. Now, can I stress on this? Asking God to reveal His power is not a not 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 of the not of the uh, prosperity theology. James five sixteen says God affects the circumstances of history through our prayers. Luke eighteen seven says God works God works justice in the world through our prayers. James four two says there are many things that God won't do until we pray. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 says, When we ask, He will give us above and beyond what we have asked for. Ephesians 6 says, Prayer is the act of our faith with which we extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And Jesus Himself teaches us to pray with shameless audacity in Luke 11, 8. See, we are encouraged to pray fervently. Here, fervently, uh, fervently does not really mean loudly or even eloquently, but it means wholeheartedly and honestly. Now, the statistics suggest that 17% of non-church-going people regularly pray, and nearly 30% of atheists pray sometimes. What this means is, I think, even in this modern secular society we live in today, generally speaking, people believe in prayer. There is a great, deep spiritual yearning in our culture today. People may not want to join any religious institution, yet they want to talk to God. In other words, we want to talk to God for all sorts of reasons and needs, yet we do not want God to find out our feelings about our needs and problems. Somehow we find it hard to be real with God. Well, the truth is, Christians are as bad as non-believers in terms of telling our emotions to God. J.I. Packer tells why he thinks that is. Being a British man himself, Packer begins by saying this, Generally speaking, European descendants are restrained in the, in the expression of emotion. Have you heard this English, English expression, stiff upper tip? I learned it last week when I was studying. Grow me. He argues that having a stiff upper lip is regarded as a virtue in Western culture, though I am not sure it is just a Western cultural thing. I am a Korean descendant, but growing up, the only time when I saw my father cry was at his brother's funeral. According to Pekka, showing fortitude or being stoic in all dealings of life are regarded as a sign of wisdom or maturity in our culture, and we habitually look down on people who voice personal complaints in public. But Pecker says that this approach is not necessarily biblical. Rather, it is the legacy of Platonism. Platonists believed that the reasoning mind is a primary and emotion was a secondary. Therefore, Emotions should be subdued and suppressed for better reasoning in dealing with any matter of life. Then Pecker says, Platonism certainly influenced the way that religious people think. Religious people might think to themselves, good Christians are always happy and we never complain. But Pecker says it is not biblical at all. Just to read the book of Psalms, it's full of emotions. In the book, you will see people complain to God and ask Him for a help out of pretty deep emotions like anger, sadness, regret, 
and unhappiness. In fact, one third of the book is a lamentation, which means weeping. Twenty times in the book, you see writers ask God, how long is this pain going to continue? You see, the Bible tells us that God knows how we speak when we are suffering and in, dis in despair. The fact that the hundreds of prayers of the petition in the Bible means that our prayers prayed out of despair, uncertainty, doubt, and confusion matter to God. And He is attentive to them. He hears our prayers. We don't have to be stoic nor pretentious before God. The scripture encourages us to pour out our hearts before God when we pray. This morning, you might be sitting here with your heart crushed for some reason or some need. The first thing that we need to know is this. Before God, we do not have to hide our feelings. Read the Psalms. Your anger, your doubt, your sadness, your hatred, and your longing is not a threat nor a surprise to God. He wants you to bring them to Him and process them in Him through prayers. He will help you process them. Does our prayer really heal people? Does it protect us from evil and change our circumstances? Yes, in His goodness, sovereign God responds to His children's cries. Does God really respond when we ask Him to help us with our anger, our hatred, and our grudge, and how we feel about a certain situation that we are dealing with? Yes, He does. Does God really fulfill our heart desires? Yes, He does. Let me do a very quick little test here. Could you please raise your hand if God has ever answered your prayer here? Now, hold your hand up and look around. Let this build your faith this morning. God answers our prayers. When there is one prayer that has not been answered and troubles your heart, count thousand other prayers that have been answered. Then lastly, we, you might want to ask, okay, Noah, I see what you're saying is what the Bible is saying, but how do we know in all things God works for the good of those who trust Him? How do we know my sickness, my suffering, and even my death will not be the end? I have been praying so fervently about this family issue of mine or a family member who does not know Christ for a long time. And I feel that my prayer has been rejected. After all these years, how can I be confident that God is good and that He hears our prayers and that this is not how things will end? How can I be confident? We can be confident because of Jesus Christ. We can be confident that God is good. He hears our prayers. He hears our morning and night prayers. And the best is yet to come. Because on the day Jesus was hung on the cross, his morning and his night was switched. The night before he was crucified, Jesus was on his knees in the garden of Gethsemane and he prayed, God, take my cup away. During that night, he was awake praying instead of peace being crushed in his spirit. Jesus prayed until his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground, yet God did not take the cup of suffering away. Next day, when Jesus was crucified at noon, darkness fell and covered over the whole land of Palestine and it became like night. In the dark, the scripture says, 
On the cross, Jesus emptied himself of all his glory and his strength, and he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yet God kept silent to his prayer, and he turned his face away from him. Why? So that we may be able to pray for peace at night and power in the morning. So that God may hear our prayers and shine his face upon us. Jesus died on the cross for our sins and gave his life as a ransom to pay our spiritual debt. So that we may have a God who hears our cries and our prayers. When Jesus died, everyone thought it was all over. All dreams and all hopes of his disciples were crushed and buried in the ground. They thought it is the end. Nothing good will come out of his tomb. They thought it was the end, the final end. But do you remember what our sovereign God did to everyone's shock? He worked the good of those who trusted in him and loved him. To everyone's surprise, God raised Jesus from the dead and lifted him up in his glory. You see, the curse turned into a blessing on the cross. The faithfulness of God, the love of God, which we know through the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, these two historical events are why we can be confident that our broken, stained, and pain-filled life is not the end of our journey. And the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Are there unanswered prayers in your life that are troubling you this morning? Are there unanswered prayers in your life that are plunging you into darkness and despair this morning? What keeps you awake during the night and makes you fear in the morning? What holds you back from trusting in God's goodness and faithfulness? Look to Jesus Christ who died and yet rose again. In the view of his glory, his cross, and the empty tomb, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, present your request to God. In Jesus Christ, even death is only the door to new home. Now, if God hears your prayers. What can stop you? If God hears your prayer because of Jesus Christ and his work, what can you, what can stop you? Nothing, nothing and nothing. Let us pray. God, I know in this room some of my friends came to church this morning with a heavy heart. Without saying too many words, Lord, we simply lift up our heads to look at the cross, to look to Jesus Christ, the beautiful Calvary where his precious blood was spilled and shed for us. The sign of the greatest love in the history. God, as we gaze on this beautiful cross, Lord, and think about the empty cross, we know this is not the end of our journey. This is not how things will end. But there is hope. There is new sunrise, new morning, new dawn waiting for us. Jesus, walk with us through the valley, through the time of the trials, through the deep chaos and confusion that we are struggling. Oh Lord, we pray that you'd give us strength and your Holy Spirit that we may continue to 
trust in you, follow you, and love you. Jesus Christ, I pray that you would enable us this morning. We rest in you and we plead to you. Oh God, you're good. You're so good. You're so, so good. Talk to us. Talk to your children this morning. Heal them. Restore them. Build them up. Strengthen them. Empower them, Lord. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, oh God. In your name we pray. Amen.